Thank you. So um, I must admit, I felt like a little bit of an imposter um, that I was put in the forest health uh, uh, session, considering that I'm not specifically uh, talking about forest health. But I was really thankful for the great overview that our speakers did, our keynote speakers did this morning in introducing the topic. And they also mentioned invasive species um, and climate change being one of those growing stressors for forests. So. Um, and I also wanted to do a little disclaimer along with that one, um, in that I'm not going to be talking about exactly how to manage invasive species in light of climate change. But what I really want to talk about is this um, frame your thinking on invasive species and climate change and talk about some of the efforts we've been uh, making with the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management um, effort to, uh, to provide research and solution and tools to invasive species and climate change challenges. So before I get started, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, um, Tony Lynn Morelli um, from the Northeast Climate Adaption Science Center, <clears throat> and Bethany Bradley from UMass. And you heard Tony speak this morning, and she actually mentioned our initiative a little bit in there. So um, before I get started, actually, I wanted to go back a little bit to um, the Executive Order on Invasive Species. And in 2016, Obama put out this executive order saying federal agencies should manage um, invasive species considering climate change. And uh, I do a lot of work with managers, and I ask them, what are your research needs? What is it that you really need to know about invasive species? What kind of research should we be promoting? And a lot of them said, well, we're supposed to do this, but how can we do this? How can we manage for upcoming uh, biological invasions in light of climate change? So this kind of uh, put forth in motion, this collaboration with UMass and the Climate Science Center, and um, we put together an initial workshop to ask managers and scientists, you know, what do you need to know? And what, how would you use that information to make decisions? And then using that information we got from our stakeholders, we started to develop a strategy to address those needs through information sharing and also through research. And so um, that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. But I'm, I'd like to first uh, talk a little bit about, so we did this understanding and communication in the ways that invasive species in and climate change interact. And then we are looking to bridge that gap between knowledge and action and consider and share management adaptions. And then uh, identify and address gaps in knowledge so that we can actually promote research to be done to meet those needs. OK, so I want to do a little bit of a framework on how, uh, what are the implications of climate change for invasive species. So fortunately, we had a great overview on climate change this morning. So um, I'll just breeze kind of through these, a couple of uh, topics that are very relevant to invasive species. We know that there's rising CO2 in our environment. We also know that the climate is warming. Um, apparently, we're going to feel more like we're in uh, Georgia or Tennessee um, some years down the road there. So we're, and also plants are going, from those regions, are going to be able to uh, survive in a, in a place that they weren't previously allowed to survive in. And we're also going to have greater extremes. So uh, larger precipitation events, flooding, hurricanes, fire, and so on, that are going to create disturbances in our environment. And so, um, under these new conditions, uh, this is our, these are actually giving invasive species a competitive edge. And so first, let's start with the rising CO2. Um, plants love CO2. And as you can see from this little diagram, I think this was actually some sort of advertisement for why CO2 wasn't bad for the environment. So the more CO2, the greater you see growth in plants. Okay, they're, the more CO2, you get them, they grow faster, they're bigger, they're more vigorous. Um, but actually, invasive species do even better than native species do under greater CO2 concentrations. And so this experiment was done by Lou Ziska, uh, and uh, he was looking at uh, Canada thistle under low and high levels of uh, CO2. And as you can see, it's a lot more vigorous, and they've actually been finding that um, they're less susceptible to herbicide treatments. So bigger, harder to manage invasive species, invasive plants. And so um, they also are very adaptable. Now, I'm assuming everyone in here 
knows what an invasive species is. And so I'm going to go with that. And so invasive species, they are really good at adapting to new places. That's why they're invasive. And so, but they're actually able to adapt to, play, to new conditions, new situations, much better than uh, native species are. Take a walk in the woods in the spring, OK? An earlier spring than normal. What's the first green thing you see? All of these invasives that you see here are the first ones to come out in the spring. So they are actually um, taking in all the nutrients. They're starting to shade out other species from coming in. And they're really getting the competitive advantage. And you can see that from this little diagram here showing that the invasive species are actually the early ones to come out. And the native ones, they are not the early bird getting the worm. They're later. They're getting less resources, less vigorous, and less able to take over. Now, this isn't only true for plants, although I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about plants. This is actually the case for um, fish and for aquatic plants as well. Uh, brook trout and brown trout, under normal temperature conditions, they can compete with each other. They're, they're equals. Under warmer temperatures, brook trout can't compete, and brown trout have a competitive advantage um, obtaining more of the food resources and outcompeting for other space. And this is also the case when comparing Eurasian water milfoil with a native milfoil, and so on and so forth. So warm water gives uh, invasives a competitive advantage. And another way that climate change is helping invasive species is that invasive species are able to move farther north than they ever were before, moving into new areas. And they especially get a lot of help from humans because we love to plant them around a lot of times as well. So thinking about kudzu, projected to move north, and it has been moving north. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid. Actually, we, there was, I remember people saying, it's too cold in the Adirondacks for hemlock woolly adelgid to survive. Well, last year we found hemlock willi adelgid in the Adirondacks. It's marching north. I wish I had the little um, animated map because you can pretty much just see as it moves north. So we're seeing that uh, hemlock willi adelgid is able to survive our winters now because they're shorter, there's less cold spells, and so on. Southern pine beetle, not non-native, but uh, really uh, damaging forest pests. Um, a case showed up in New York in uh, 2014. A researcher that I was talking with from, um, from New Hampshire was saying, yeah, I used to have to go really far to my field sites to study southern pine beetle, and now I don't have to anymore. And so we just have seen it marching north as well along with the other species. And this is also the case for aquatics as well. We're seeing um, water hyacinth, hyacinth moving north. Asian clams are moving north as well. And this is actually, so given the number of invasive species we have relative to our southern um, counterparts, we actually pr are projected to be a hot spot for future invasion. So while the south might end up losing some of their invasives because they get too warm for some of our current invasives to survive, the northeast is going to be prime habitat for a lot of invasives. Um, Extreme events also, damaging to some of our native species, open up light and resources and allow invasives to come in. And then another topic that we don't think about quite as much is this awakening of sleeper species. Now a sleeper species is usually a non-native species that's present, so maybe like a naturalized plant that we just see in our environment. But then once the conditions change and there's a, it's warmer, it's milder, that species actually becomes invasive. And so we're starting to see this with both insects and plants. Um, there's examples of barnacles, plants, um, insects as well. And even one of our native, uh, native scales, this was really interesting research from North Carolina State University that Steve Frank did with one of his graduate students, um, Adam Dale at the time. He was, he's been using um, cities as, as uh, to simulate climate change because cities tend to be a little bit warmer, a little bit drier, um, and so he would compare trees that were infested with a scale in city temp climate and compare it to outside the city where it was a couple degrees cooler. And what he found was that this scale that wasn't invasive in the cooler climate actually became invasive and highly damaged the red maples in the city. And they actually repeated this in a greenhouse experiment and showed that pro non-problematic um, scales in the future under climate change could become problematic. So just in summary here of what climate's opportunities, uh, what climate change's opportunities are for invasive species, um, increased growth because of CO2, earlier green up and um, other competitive advantages, northward shifts, we're going to see new ones moving in, better establishment due to increased uh, disturbance, and then waking up these sleeper invasive species.
So what can we do about it? And this is where the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change um, Initiative came into play. Um, we really wanted to start to identify some of those upcoming invasives. This is what the managers were telling us in the meeting. We need to know what to expect. We need to know what we should be putting on our watch list, what we should be looking for out there. And then we have all these lists of species. How are we going to prioritize which ones we should be looking for first? Which ones are the most problematic? Um, you know, and really starting to look at what are some of the characteristics of these sleeper species, looking to our neighbors to the south and seeing where some of those species might have been invasive. And then adapting our management strategies. What does that look like? What does it mean to adapt your management strategies for some of these species? And then just really giving the opportunity to share knowledge and experience between researchers and managers. So what we've started to do is to try to synthesize uh, research and information that we have on some of these topics. We've published, um, not published in uh, research journals, but published um, in the gray literature, some management challenges where we're summarizing some of these. We have weekly uh, summaries of research articles that we think would be relevant for invasive species managers. And we summarize them and try to um, pull out some of the management implications. And then we've also gotten together in groups with researchers and managers and really fleshed out research proposals, submitted them, and had uh, researchers get funding to actually do some of the, this work. And so Jenica Allen from the University of New Hampshire, she's been doing this actually before RISC even started, but even more so now. She was looking at projecting which species are going to move into the different states. And she did this for New York State saying, according to her models, this list of species of uh, plants, so this is specifically for plants, we're, gonna, we're likely to move into New York State. And so actually, New York State was really proactive about this. And they took this list, and then they put all of these species that they normally would not have assessed because they weren't present. We usually only assess species that are present in New York State or likely to or right on our borders put these through our assessment process, and now these are actually poised to be considered for regulating or prohibiting. So this is like proactive listing of species. Um, it hasn't happened yet, so if you're a horticulturist out there who might be disturbed by this idea, don't get too upset yet. But this is, this is a real, from you know, taking the research, the model, taking it through the steps, and then taking it to a management action or a policy action. And so, and this way we won't be starting to use some of these species in horticulture and in our landscaping, and then um, find out, oh no, we shouldn't have done that down the road, which is what's happened with a lot of the invasive plants we have today. Um, and then on, on top of this, is that the second three minutes? First one. Oh, okay. Okay, and then on top of that, to take that a step for, further, so she, she, Jenica spent a really long time on the New York State part, interacted with us, came, but she can't do that for all the states all the time. So what she did was we, she got a grant from USDA and Northeast IPM Center, and now has developed an online tool where managers can actually go in and look for their state, um, and they can actually choose some of the criteria that they're going to use, some of the filters, and get a list of these species so that you can start thinking about it on your own. And that's going to be available, I think, early next year. I think it's almost on the, um, on the brink of being ready for, and that's going to be hosted by EdMaps. And then the other thing is, okay, so we have this big list of species. Well, which one should we be worried about first? I mean, that's, that's a question that a lot of invasive species managers have. We need to prioritize because we can't think about all species everywhere. And so um, the idea of, let's think about like which species are gonna have the highest impact. And so that was one of the things that the managers had requested. Like, we want to know which ones we should be the most worried about. So Bethany Bradley and one of her students from UMass um, went in and they actually ran all of these species that Jenica had produced through a ranking system that was, is called ICAT. And it actually ranks species based on their impact. And so she came up with a list that looks something like this. Now, this is a draft. Um, so this, but where she actually had high priority species, like the ones you should be the most worried about, having your volunteers keep an eye out for it and, and making sure that it gets you know, regulated or prohibited early, down to the ones that are less, um, less impactful or data deficient, that maybe we should start doing some research and collecting more data on those. So this really helps guide our efforts and think towards the future in a more strategic way. 
And so to date, the Risk Initiative has, I, I see some familiar faces out here that have actually been a part of it, but we had the initial workshop to identify the direction we should go. We've had two annual symposiums um, that were really meant to bring together invasive species managers and researchers and have workshops and discussions about what information we have, what we need moving forward. We do have this, re this listserv where we circulate all of these weekly or bi-weekly summaries where we're, we're getting some of the research out and kind of boiling it down into a short paragraph. Um, and we also have the management challenges that I mentioned where we're going a little deeper and synthesizing a number of research papers. And then we're putting together these working groups um, of researchers and managers so we can actually like put together proposals that will have meaningful outcomes that people can then use to make um, their decisions. And so um, these are just, uh, this is our website. Um, it's, it's hosted at UMass. We have a listserv if you want to sign up for it. Um, we are hosting another annual symposium, which I'll talk about in a minute. And also, if you're doing research or management, I think sometimes you know, we, try to, we keep research and management in separate worlds, but we really need to work with managers in order to test and adapt, the same way we were talking about this morning, in um, this adaptive management and really understanding what, what's happening out in the field and measuring it and then going back. And you, know, you guys are the eyes on the ground, the people that are out there managing, managing forests and managing invasive species to actually start monitoring and, and handling some of these changes. So I also just wanted to give a plug for, so risk in 2019 will be uh, merged with the North American Invasive Species Management Association conference um, that's going to be held in Saratoga Springs and the theme is connecting science to action. We're going to be opening this up for um, we're going to be opening this up for, for proposal for proposed talks in January. So keep an eye out and please can contribute. We're accepting both research and management experiences as presentations. So that's the purpose of the conference. So with that, I will take whatever questions. Thanks. Aaron. Yeah, that was great, Carrie. Thanks. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, um, you know, origin seems to be a real big push for all of this. People hate non-native things. Um, but one of my f uh, favorite examples is, uh, well, maybe not favorite, but I think a good example of the southern pine beetle expansion in the northeast, something that wasn't a problem but is now, um, for a good reason, um, and to be attention to. And, and so I'm just kind of wondering about within this framework, are you guys thinking about native species? Uh, I think like black locust. Uh, right. It's more and more weedy as it gets north in certain areas. I mean, are you considering adding and thinking about the quote unquote sleeper species that actually may be native? That's yeah, for sure. So I mean, I feel like we talk a lot about invasive species because non-native species have a tendency to have these these characteristics of, of spreading, being damaging, having some sort of impact along with them. But I certainly think that you know, paying attention to sleeper species, and one of the, when I was first came into my position and southern pine beetle came in, we, you know, there was a lot of debate about whether it was native or, or non, uh, not native, whether what should be treated as an invasive species because it was so damaging and it hadn't previously been found in New York State. And so there was a big debate about that. Um, in the end, the management response is the same. And so, you know, the or that was really just more about what pot of money it should come out of, right? So, and we're going to have more and more of those those conversations. So, that's, definitely, that's, that's, that's definitely important. Sure. Other questions? Sure. think about the correlation between invasive plants, uh, particularly aquatic, and, uh, and increased nutrients. And, you know, sometimes I think what we're seeing is that the aquatic, you know, the, the exotic invasive plant infestation is a symptom of a greater problem of nutrient loading. And I don't know, I mean, it seems like, I know it's not climate change before they seem really, uh, you know, really closely connected. Yeah, so um, this is something if you had came to maybe one of my other talks at another time, you would see, a lot of times we think about 
if an invasive is there, we just automatically assume that the reason it's there is because it took over everything else um, and out, out competed all its native species, it you know, caused all this damage. But a lot of times we're just creating these, these environments that then invasive species just take advantage of them. So like you're talking about like, you know, we throw extra nutrients from agricultural runoff or whatever into a system, and then the invasive species come in and take advantage of it. So yeah, I mean, it is, there's definitely all of these interactions. And I feel like sometimes it is just a symptom. And so, um, and we're going to see, it's just, we're going to see more and more of that as we make, you know, all these changes to our environment. I think deer, they are eating a lot of the native species, they're allowing invasives to continue to persist because they don't taste as good. And so, you know, what we really need to get rid of is the deer, not necessarily the, the invasive species that we continue to go out and remove and it comes back. And so, yeah, I, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I, I agree with you, you know, we've got to really work out, and I think that's where research comes in, to work out whether, you know, the invasive species um, is just a symptom and what we can do about that initial cause. So, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.